Well, let's continue our discussion on data flow diagramming from the previous slide deck. Uh, so as far as using data flow diagrams as an analysis tool, uh, again, data flow diagramming, our, our main purpose here is that we're trying to get a good understanding of the system that we're, uh, that we're studying, right? Or that we're going to replace. So one thing it can help us do is a gap analysis. By using data flow diagrams, we can do a gap analysis. What is a gap analysis? That is looking for things that are missing in the current workflow. What, what things could make the process more efficient or better or improve the process, right? So what kind of inefficiencies might we identify? Um, as far as uh, using DFDs, another way we can use DFDs is for business process reengineering or BPR. So here you see an example of a process at IBM, uh, and this is from your textbook from Modern Systems Analysis and Design where they show a, a simple data flow diagram describing a process at IBM, and they use new technology to improve that process. Uh, so they, and, and that would be business process reengineering. It's understanding what the current process is and understanding what, what technology can do for us to change that process, or how can a system improve that process. And a lot of times when we look at systems, sometimes systems exist because they existed before we had systems that could do that work, and computers uh, in general, computing can uh, eliminate the need for a lot of steps in a process because the computer can automate those steps. So that might be a part of business process reengineering. All right, and finally in this unit, I want to talk about data uh, uh, modeling with data lot or modeling logic with decision tables. So basically, a decision table is a matrix that represents the logic of a decision. And the reason we use these logic tables is when we have a, a very complicated decision that software has to make, or if there's a complicated decision being made in a system, you know, there's a lot of conditions, right? So let's say someone's describing to you a, a, a complicated list of conditions in order to decide what to do when transforming or, or you know, doing something with data, as we talked about in the data flow diagram. Uh, if that happens, then we probably need to have a more structured way to analyze how we make that decision. And it can really help us understand that decision process uh, much better. Um, so basically you have, with the decision uh, uh, table, you have condition stubs that show uh, the conditions, right? The relevant conditions that you're, that you're evaluating to make a decision. And the action stubs show what you're going to do based on those conditions. So you're gonna show conditions, what you're gonna do, and the rules, which are part of those uh, uh, that specifies what actions will be followed for a given set of conditions. And then you have in different conditions on a decision table where the value is not affected by actions that are taken for two or more rules, right? So that's an indifferent uh, condition where we don't care. You know, a variety of things could happen. It doesn't matter for that particular action. So I'm going to use an example to, to demonstrate this. But basically, the procedure for creating a decision table is first you name all of the conditions and then all of the values that each of those conditions can assume. Then you name all of the possible actions that it can occur, and then you list all the possible rules, and you define the actions for each one of those rules, and then you try to simplify the table. And really, that's the most important part, simplification. It's kind of like finding the least common denominator. Uh, you're trying to identify, you know, what's the least I, I need to do to make a decision, uh, to distill that decision down to the least number of steps. Sometimes decisions are not as complicated as you think. That's kind of the point here. In order to demonstrate this, I'm going to use the example of employee payroll logic, right? So you usually have two different types of pay. You have regular pay, overtime pay, and then missed work, right? So we have two different, I'm sorry, three different types of pay here that a system might have. And then you've got two types of employees. We have salary employees and hourly employees. So again, you have regular pay, overtime pay, and missed work where you don't get paid for that time. And then you have salary and hourly employees, which are two values. If I multiply that, that means I'm going to have a minimum of six rules, right? I have to have six rules. So let's go ahead and, and list this. So we have our conditions. So we have our rules, which are salary or hourly employee, right? And then we have our employee type and hours worked, which are our, uh, our different uh, uh, conditions, right? So you have two conditions. And then we have this, the, uh, uh, the various types of pay, and that gives us a total of six rules. Okay, So for example, an employee that is a, a regular employee um, or an employee that's salary uh, gets paid a certain amount, and an employee that's hourly gets paid a certain way based on the number of hours that they work. 
So now that I have all of that on my table, now I'm going to show all of the possible actions, right? So I have my first, I have my rules and my conditions. Now I'm going to add the actions that I'm going to take for each one of those. So if I have an employee that is salary and they worked less than 40 hours, we're going to pay their base salary. If I have an employee that is hourly and they work less than 40 hours, I'm going to calculate their hourly wage and generate an absence report. If it's a salary employee that worked 40 hours, I pay their base salary. If it's an hourly employee who worked 40 hours, I calculate their hourly wage. And if it's a salary employee over 40 hours, I pay their base salary. And if it's an hourly over 40 hours, I calculate their hourly wage and I calculate the overtime because we also have to pay overtime. So our first step, when we look at that, we're going to define the action. We already defined our action for each rule. So here we have, uh, if you look at this, we have some, some indifferent decisions here, right? The uh, paying base salary. That is always going to happen for a salary employee, regardless of any of the other conditions, right? So right there, I can already start to simplify this. So I can basically get rid of all of those conditions for salary, because I, there's really only one condition for salary. Uh, if, if they're a salary employee, I pay their base salary, and that's it. I, I, can take, I, you know, I need to take no further action in that case. But then for my, uh, my, my hourly employee, I still have my three conditions that I have to check. So here I went from, let's go back, from six rules down to only evaluating four rules. So I've simplified this process quite a bit. All right. So here we have our, our four rules. And let's go ahead and make this into pseudocode. So if I were a developer, uh, you know, or if I was, you know, talking to a user, I would say, okay, so basically the process is if they're salary, then pay the base salary. Otherwise, if they're hourly, pay their hourly wage up to 40 hours. And if the worked hours is greater than 40, then pay the overtime. And if it's less than 40, generate the absence report. And that should capture all of the condition, all of the logic that I need in order to pay that employee. All right. And then, of course, there's a, uh, a, a demonstration in your textbook using the, the e-commerce site, right? So this is the example data flow diagram for the e-commerce site in your textbook which I didn't want to talk about too much in this, uh, in this presentation. So in this presentation, what I talked about is uh, understanding the logical process modeling via data flow diagrams, data flow diagrams of well-structured process models, decomposition of data flow diagrams into their lower level uh, diagrams. I talked about the importance of balance, right? So consistency between these different diagrams as you go deeper into the uh, decomposition of these diagrams. And then using data flow diagrams for analyzing information systems, for doing gap analysis, and for business process re-engineering, which we discussed in, in uh, very briefly. And then finally, I talked about using decision tables to represent the logic when we have particularly complicated decisions that we're making in our system. And that's it. So that's all we need to cover for this unit. And in the next unit, I'm going to start talking about using object-oriented techniques or using some UML techniques for our requirements analysis. So we'll get into that in the next unit. We'll start talking about UML.